Hi, this is Daryl Maya from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, May 24th, 2013. Finally, it's Friday, right? Forgive me, I'm a little casual today. I've been working around the house, getting ready to get rid of so much stuff, to clean out things, to have a fresh start, getting my house ready for my home studio. It's exciting, very exciting times. Anyway, this channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, and end time events. And with that in mind, let's have a look at what's going on around the world today. Here's a story out of religion today. Did you hear what the Pope said? The Pope said atheists are redeemed by doing good. This was the Pope that said this. Pope Francis caused a stir this week when he declared during his homily at Wednesday Mass in Rome that everyone was redeemed through Jesus, including atheists. The Huffington Post reported this. Francis emphasized the importance of doing good as a principle that unites all humanity and told the story of a Catholic who asked a priest if even atheists had been redeemed by Jesus. Even them, every one, the Pope answered, we all have the duty to do good. The Lord has redeemed all of us, all of us with the blood of Christ, all of us, not just Catholics, everyone, Father, the atheist, even the atheists, everyone. We must meet one another doing good. But I don't believe, Father, I am an atheist, but do good. We will meet one another there do good. The Pope is saying everyone is redeemed by Christ, even those who don't believe in him. What do you make of that? Is that not false teaching? Is that not another gospel? The Bible tells me that only those who believe upon Jesus Christ and call upon his name will be saved. If you don't call upon the name of Jesus as your Savior, how can you be redeemed? Atheists can't be redeemed. They can be redeemed if they repent of their sins and ask Jesus Christ into their lives as their Lord and Savior and their King, but by refusing to believe in Him, that's actually blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, is it not? Doesn't the Bible call that the only unforgivable sin? The Pope, one who you would think would know the truth, but does he really? We're talking the Pope. You know, I have always been of the mindset that a future Pope would probably be the false prophet spoken of in Revelation. And please, my Catholic friends, don't, don't bash on me for this. I'm not bashing your religion. Even though it's not your religion that saves you, it's only a relationship with Jesus Christ that can save you, not your religion. But the false prophet would have to have a powerful position, a, 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 a position of authority. One who was looked up to as being someone who knew, right? Here's the Pope saying, everyone is redeemed, even the atheists. I'm sorry, that's not what my Bible or my Savior teach me in the Holy Scriptures. Um... Here's a story out of the Washington Post, a surprising map of where the world's atheists live. Now keep in mind, atheists do not believe in God. They believe we're just random acts of accidental creation, that we were created out of nothing, by nothing, and became something. <laughs> Pope Francis' pronouncement that God has redeemed us all, even the atheists, surprised both believers and non-believers around the world who are used to stricter edicts from the Catholic Church. It also got people wondering where the world's atheists live. Now, there's surprisingly little data available on this subject, but a 2012 poll by WIN Gallup International, an international polling firm that's not associated with the D.C.-based Gallup Group, asked more than 50,000 people in 40 countries whether they considered themselves religious, not religious, or convinced atheists. Overall, the poll concluded that roughly 13% of global respondents identified as atheists, more than double the percentage in the United States. The highest share of atheists is in China. 47 percent. Faith has a very complicated history in China. The state is deeply skeptical of organized religion, which it has long considered a threat to its authority. So, uh, Japan has 31 percent that call themselves atheists. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Where else? Nationalism in Germany, a bit of post-war taboo has developed around religion. 
Um, let's see. T -t Saudi Arabia, where 5% say they're atheists. Let's see. G -g 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 -g. There, there's other areas, but China has the biggest amount. Uh, let's see. Italy, a stone's throw from the Vatican Chapel where Pope Francis spoke on Wednesday. The Catholic Church has little to fear. Despite a gradual slide in Catholic baptisms in Italy over the past several decades, nearly three-fourths of Italians consider themselves religious. Interesting. So, China. Biggest grouping of atheists. In fact, on the map, it's the only darkened area between 40 and 50 percent. China. Uh, and then there is Japan that has between 30 to 39 percent. America is in the 5 to 9 percent range. Interesting. Atheists, let me just tell you something. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross to save you as well. All you have to do is believe this to be true and believe that God raised him from the dead just like Jesus said he would. Because, let me tell you something, Jesus Christ is coming back again. Right now, he's preparing a place for us. Said in my father's, house is, my father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will return. I will come back. How's the peace process going in Israel? Out of Yahoo, carries focus on peace talks, not settlements. Really? Because this story tells me he's more focused on settlements. I'm kind of confused by the headline that says Kerry's focus on peace talks not settlements but then you read the story and it says US Secretary of State John Kerry urged Israel's government on Friday to prevent further settlement construction where possible to help revitalize Middle East peace hopes but stressed that the Jewish state and Palestinians alike should remain focused on the larger goal of restarting direct negotiations here's an idea how about no preconditions to starting negotiations no negotiating before you get to the negotiating table. Okay? Come with an open mind, an open heart, and an open book, and say, here's what we want, and what do you want? Problem is, Palestinians don't want peace. They want all of the land of Israel. That's their goal. If you don't believe me? Look what Mahmoud Abbas, look at the map he was passing around, the UN meetings over the past couple of years, that have an entire map of Palestine and no Israel because that's their true goal. That's what they really want. No peace. Don't think anything's going to cause any peace there anyway until Christ returns. Have you seen some of the earthquakes around the world? You know in Matthew 24 when um, and actually Mark 13 and Luke 21 when the disciples asked Jesus what would be the sign of your return? Of course the first thing Jesus said was watch that no one deceives you but he also said there would be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilence. Powerful earthquake hits Russia. Russia, who I believe is in Daniel 7 verse 5 as the bear that was told to devour much flesh and who will also be with Iran leading a world army against Israel in Ezekiel 38. Wasn't it just a couple of days ago that Benjamin Netanyahu went to Russia and said, please don't give Syria this S-300 missile system? And Russia said, yeah, we're going to still give it to them. Sorry, well, we made that deal a while back. We're going to honor it. And now they get hit with an 8.2 earthquake? Coincidence? You tell me. Because <laughs> I don't think there are any coincidences with God. I think he does everything for a reason and has a purpose in all his actions, even what we perceive to be tragedy. Powerful earthquake hit Russia's far east with tremors felt as far away as Moscow. Quake registered an 8.0 on the Richter scale, but the US Geological Survey reported a magnitude of 8.2. That's a big earthquake, people. Think God's trying to shake things up? Well, there was also a 7.4 magnitude off Tonga. Um, now, I don't know what's been going on in Tonga. Um, I can tell you there's not a lot of followers of Christ in Tonga. They tend to worship in a different manner. Also, there was a 5.7 in Northern California. 
little shaking up going on around the world. <laughs> you know, keep in mind, earthquakes have always been from God. I mean, when Christ died on the cross, there was a huge earthquake. Split the temple. Tore the curtain in two. That separated the Holy of Holies. Basically, being very symbolic is the fact that Jesus Christ tore down the barrier that kept man from being able to have fellowship with God. Of course, that barrier was sin. Jesus paid the price for that. So he thereby made us able to have fellowship with God the Father because of what he did on the cross. But if you don't believe in Jesus and the work he did on the cross, you will not be saved. I don't care what the Pope tells you. Read Judges 15, verses 1 through 20. A lot of you know the story of Samson. As Samson arrived in Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph, but the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. He snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrist. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and killed a thousand Philistines with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. Now Samson was very thirsty. He cried out to the Lord, You've accomplished this great victory by the strength of your servant. But I now die, must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of these pagans? So God caused water to gush out of a hollow in the ground at Lehi, and Samson was revived as he drank. Then he named that place the spring of the one who cried out, and it is still in Lehi to this day. Samson judged Israel for 20 years during the period when the Philistines dominated the land. The Lord's strength came upon Samson, but he was proud and he boasted only of his own strength. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men, he said. And then later he asked God to refresh him because of his accomplishments. Samson was physically and emotionally exhausted, but after this victory, his attitude declined quickly into self-pity, don't you think? Must I now die of thirst? I mean, when God responded and created this fresh spring water, Samson named the place after himself, never mentioning God who provided it. You know, we can become emotionally very vulnerable after a, a, a great effort or, or when we're faced with a real physical need. Pride can cause us to take credit for work that we've done only because of the strength of God working in us. It's not us. It's God. We need to give credit where credit is due. Okay? I just recently came through a very dark time in my life. Uh, and <laughs> I was emotionally checked out and was actually moving in a completely different direction. And then God caused me to swallow my pride. And everything that happened was because of God and the Holy Spirit working in me. It wasn't me at all because me and my weak self and my pride was ready to foolishly do something else. And I think we need to be careful of pride. Pride tends to step in and tell us, oh, you're doing good, oh, you're fine, oh, your abilities are so amazing. You know, I think the devil likes to trick us with pride. He knows where we're weak, and he'll play on our weaknesses. Don't ever think he doesn't, because he does. I think during these times we need to avoid the temptation to believe that God owes us something for our efforts, because it was God's strength that gives us victory, certainly not our own. We need to make sure that we give God all the credit. You know, do you ever feel like God owes you something for all the sacrifices you've made for Him? You know, do, do you resent God for not rewarding your hard work or your service sometimes? I think we all know that God doesn't owe us anything. Um... But maybe you still feel unappreciated. Maybe, maybe you serve somewhere and you feel like your efforts go unnoticed. Or you feel like nobody seems to see all that you've sacrificed to do what you do. Sometimes we need to take time and, and step back from our service. 
and allow God to refresh us. You know, God wants you to be refreshed, just like Samson. He cares about our needs, our desires. But if, if you need to simply rest in His love, then do that. I mean, even I have to take time off from doing this daily ministry, Monday through Friday, five days a week, sometimes six days a week. It can be a little daunting sometimes. I, I, sometimes I wonder how I'm going to come up with a message. But you know what? God always provides a way. God's Word is as fresh today as it was 2,000 years ago. And it is living and breathing and is very powerful. Um, God wants your heart, though. He wants your heart. So if your service to God is taking you away from loving God, something needs to change, okay? We all need to serve. We're all called into service. But make sure you're doing it for the right reasons and with the right heart and with the right attitude. And make sure that you know it's not you, it's not me, but Christ working in me, okay? Luke 24, 47 in the New Living Translation says, With my authority, take this message of repentance to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. These are the words of Christ. Here's some other words of forgiveness from the Bible. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How about Isaiah 43, 25 through 26? I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. Acts 3, 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Isaiah 1, 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Ephesians 1, 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Daniel 9, verse 9, The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against Him. Do you guys like to take risks? I have to say, <laughs> taking risks has always been one of my favorite things. Um... I know some of you know this, but maybe others of you don't, but I, I've been a professional actor for some 25, 30 years. And as an actor, you're taught that you must take risks. I mean, I've been in the theater since I was like seven years old, eight years old. Um, in fact, I, was, I have been told I played a part of baby Jesus when I was a mere infant. So, I, I, of course, I don't remember that, but I've been told. Um, and, and I've always been this adventure guy, you know, I like to mountain bike and snow ski and I've gone bungee jumping and I'm certified scuba diver. I've, I've gone skydiving. I like to take risks. It's kind of fun. Read Acts 9 verse 1 through 20 because a lot of Christians like to play it safe. They gather as many facts as they can, they analyze the options, and they make choices in order to be reasonably certain of the outcome. We tend to label risk as undesirable because it could end up causing loss and heartache. We, we are afraid of unwanted results as much as we dread missing out on our dreams, but I think people are afraid of looking foolish or incompetent, uh, taking on some kind of financial difficulty, or even physical danger. But from a human viewpoint, eliminating uncertainty makes sense, right? I think so. But what's God's perspective? Are, are there times that Christians are supposed to take risks? I think the answer is a resounding yes. We must. When he's the only one asking us to step out of our comfort zone, because from the Lord's viewpoint, there is no uncertainty. 
because he has control over all things and he'll never fail to accomplish his good purposes. Ephesians 1 verse 11. The Bible's full of people who took risk to obey the Lord. One was Ananias. God sent to minister to the newly converted Saul. Ananias risked his reputation and his life to comply. Another was Saul himself. He was told to preach to the Jews the very gospel that they had violently opposed. By focusing on God, his character, and his promises, both men obeyed despite uncertainty, doubt, fear, and the risk to their own lives. I think spiritual maturity is kind of hampered when Christians refuse to obey God, don't you? Sometimes that involves leaving what's safe or familiar. You know, getting away from the shore and out into the middle of the deep water where the waves roll and the winds howl. Taking a risk. What risk might the Lord be calling you to today? I think He understands your, your wariness, but He'll never let you down. He'll never lead you to something He won't lead you through. So step out in obedience and watch what He does with your faith. Take a risk. You know, here pretty soon it's going to be a risk to say Jesus Christ is the only way to God the Father. It's going to be a risk to say Jesus Christ died on the cross to save you from hell and He rose again. It's going to be a risk to say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Are you willing to take a risk at that point? I think God has been training me my entire life to serve Him completely and holy with all that I am and all that I have and I'm ready to take the biggest risk of all to proclaim Jesus Christ to a world that doesn't want to hear it and to a world that violently opposes the truth of God's Word. I'm ready for that risk. I'm committed. I'm fully ready to do all that God has called me to do. Galatians 1.10 For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. You know, this is one of the signs of our modern time. There's a lot of people that are guilty at merely nibbling at the truth of the Christian gospel. They don't fully grasp the whole meat of it. You know, think about the ways that preaching the Word of God is being pulled down to the level of the ignorant and the spiritually obtuse and those who don't really fully grasp the gospel. It seems like we have to tell stories and jokes and entertain people and amuse them in order to have a few people in attendance at church these days. You know, I think some people do these things because of their reputation and so that there will be money in the treasury to meet the church bills. I think a lot of churches, Christianity has been watered down until the solution is so weak that if it were poison, it wouldn't hurt anyone. And if it were medicine, it wouldn't cure anyone. I think we need to get into the full gospel truth. All the promises of God. Repent of our sins. And accept Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and King because He's coming back, people. And we don't want to be found unworthy when He returns. We don't want to be found sitting around doing nothing. We need to watch and pray. We need to serve until He returns. We need to do the work for Christ until that time. Lord, don't ever let me be guilty of watering down the truth or playing to the crowds or being concerned about my reputation or what people might think of me. Let me serve you fully with a heart for you, Lord. I want to have a heart for you, Father. I want to serve my Savior well until the day I see Him. Revelation 5 talks about a helpless lamb, but this helpless lamb turned out to be the mightiest of all the creatures. Revelation 5, 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. There's images of Jesus all over Revelation. And one way to study the book is to, to follow a single image throughout. I mean, after his appearance in the first chapter, Jesus is presented as a king, a child, a warrior on a horse, the Lord of the whole earth, the husband of a bride. Of all these images, though, none is so startling and unlikely as the one that appears in John's second vision. Yet it takes hold and appears repeatedly throughout the book. Here's, here, the book of Revelation uses more visual drama than, than science fiction movies of today, okay? 
There's lightning flashes, the sky growls, and creatures encircle this lofty throne. Four of the creatures in Revelation 4-6 seem to symbolize the most impressive of all creation. For common saying in those days went, The mightiest among the birds is the eagle. The mightiest among the domestic animals is the bull. The mightiest among the wild beasts is the lion. And the mightiest of all is man. Only one was worthy, though. There was this question, who's worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, Revelation 5.2? Who's worthy to introduce the next phase of history? No one can answer. Not one of the four impressive creatures were qualified. Then John sees another creature, a lamb looking as if it had been slain, Revelation 5.6. A lamb looking as if it had been slain. None of these majestic angels or, or the elders or living creatures has the right to break the seals. Only a lamb does. A helpless slaughtered lamb. John talks about this song of celebration. You're worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for, God's, for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelation 5.9 There was a song <clears throat> set to earthly music much later in Handel's Messiah, remember? And, and other places in Revelation, true believers are identified as having their names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 21.27 this powerful image resurfaces several times in Revelation, a, a book of warfare between good and evil. Christ the King is also the Lamb, the one who died for us. His death on the cross, which seemed to be a great defeat, actually ushered in a decisive victory for Him and for us. <laughs> good was not destroyed, it triumphed. It triumphed. Jesus overcame death, overcame sin, overcame the enemy, overcame this world, overcame the cross. And since he's in us, people, we too have overcome. 1 John 4, 6 says, We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Hath thou considered my servant Job, says Satan. He serves thee now, but thou hast set a hedge about him and hast blessed him. Let me but touch him. Now he's come down to you and he has afflicted you in your estate, afflicted you in your family. And at last he's afflicted you in your body. Will Satan be the conqueror? Who do you focus on? Will grace give way? We need to stand up and say once more, once for all, I tell thee, Satan, the grace of God is more than a match for you. He's with me. And in all this, I will not utter one word against the Lord my God. He does all things well, even now, and I do rejoice in Him. Do you focus on your storm, trials around you? The Lord is always pleased with His children when they stand up for Him, when the circumstances seem to belie Him. Okay? Picture a courtroom. We've seen a lot of courtroom things on TV recently. Jody Arias, we've got uh, O.J. Simpson... Hey, you see these this guy that kidnapped the girls for a decade. Here comes the witnesses into the court. The devil says, soul, God has forgotten you. I will bring in my witness. First, he summons up your debts. This long bill of losses. There, he says, would God suffer you to fall like this if he loved you? Then he brings in your children, either their death or their disobedience or something worse and says, would the Lord suffer these things to come upon you if he loved you? And at last he brings in your pitiful body with all your doubts and your fears, your tremblings, your hidings from Jehovah's face. Ah, now says the devil, do you believe that God loves you now? He's cunning, he's tricky, he's crafty. If you're able to stand forth and say to these witnesses, I hear what you have to say. Let God be true and every man and everything a liar. I believe none of you. You all say God does not love me, but he does. <clears throat> and if the witnesses against his love were multiplied a hundredfold, yet still would I say, I know whom I have believed. Psalm 42 verse 3 says, My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? I think our brother Paul answered this quite well in Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? 
as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who do you trust? Who do you focus on in your times of trouble? Do you focus on the one who brings the trouble? The one who causes the trouble? Or do you focus on your Redeemer? Your Christ, your salvation? The slain Lamb of God. The only one worthy to open the seal. People, we need to put our trust where our trust is due. In the one who died to save us. The one who redeems us from the perils of this world. The only one who can save us. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeshua, our Savior, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The one we will serve with in His millennial reign here on earth. Teaching and leading others to the cross of Christ. Do you serve Him now? You're told to. You're called to. Listen, you guys have a great weekend. Go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Take somebody with you. Woo! <laughs> serve Him with your life. Serve Him with all you have. Serve Him with your gifts, your talents, your finances, your, your voice, your body, your family. Serve Him in every way you can. Stand strong on the promises of God and don't worry what this world or the dark people, the lost people, the atheists of this world will do to you. Don't worry about that. Are you here to please God or are you here to please man? Let me tell you, there's coming a time when we're all going to have to take lots of risks and say no to what the government tells us to do. Oh, take this mark and you can eat and a buy and sell and have a job and continue in the way of life you know. Well, the mm, Bible tells me not to do that. So, sorry. I'm going to have to say no to you and yes to God. Okay? If it comes down to pleasing God or pleasing man, you better choose God. Because trying to please man will not grant you access into heaven. Neither will trying to please God. You must accept Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and King. You must. He's the only name under heaven by which you must be saved. I hope you know this truth. If you don't send me a message, I'd be glad to help walk you through it. God bless you guys. Have a great weekend, and good Lord willing, I'll see you again next Monday.